Hello, everybody. Welcome to Storage 301, deep dive on Amazon S3 security and management. My name is Felix Davis. I am a principal product manager in Amazon S3. So, so one of the biggest trends we're seeing in S3 is that uh, workloads are becoming much more active uh, over the last few years. So we're seeing a lot of customers doing a lot of data analytics on your, in your data in S3. In a lot of customer conversations, uh, customers are looking at data lakes. A lot of people are starting and looking at uh, the potential for data lakes on S3. Um, but that is, that is making challenging kind of the, the most basic principle of security in terms of least privilege, where you want to incrementally add permissions to people who need access to that data, as opposed to starting with a very broad set of permissions and then kind of narrowing it down. Uh, so because you have now a lot more producers of data putting data, putting objects into your buckets, you have a lot more people consuming data from those buckets. So, so things like bucket policies are becoming more and more complex. Um, so the other thing that uh, comes up a lot with customers is a uh, concern around data exfiltration. How do I make sure that my users are only locked down to my corporate-owned buckets, and how do I make sure that my corporate-owned buckets are only locked down to specific users? So, so we'll talk a lot about that in terms of a lot of tools and capabilities that we're introducing to help you with that. So the, for the session today, uh, first we're going to cover access control methods. I'm going to talk about IAM, identity and access management policies, bucket policies, and how to use them. Uh, we're going to talk about block public access, how to prevent your buckets from becoming public. I'm going to introduce uh, S3 access points. So if you saw in Andy's keynote, we introduced, we just launched it this week. We're super excited about it. I'll explain how, what they are and how you use them. And then we're going to cover data protection. So what are the methods you can prevent inadvertent or malicious data deletion? We're going to talk about encryption methods. And then finish up with monitoring and management of security policies. And I'm also going to give you a showing of IAM Access Analyzer, which is a new capability that we introduced on Monday that helps you interpret your resource policies. OK. So, uh, so with access controls, uh, we've, the, really the two fundamental access controls are IAM policies and, and bucket policies. An IAM policy is a user-based policy. So it defines what can this user do within AWS. So, so IAM is, is really flexible. It's across all AWS services. You can use it for federation, uh, from uh, allowing, uh, net, uh, allowing people from your corporate identity provider. Um, and then uh, bucket policies determine which principles, who can access this S3 resource under which conditions. Uh, and the two are, are flexible in terms of they, they both are the same kind of JSON policy format. And I'll, I'll show you some examples in coming slides. And then you can also use object tags. Now, object tags, each object you can tag, uh, you can have up to 10 tags. A tag is like a key value pair. So you can be, it's very flexible. You can name them as you wish. So for example, you put a tag like a, a project tag name and then a value x, and you can put them in your IAM policies and bucket policies to be very granular to say these principles can only access these specific uh, objects in your bucket. And then access control lists, uh, now with an ACL, you can put an access control list at a bucket level or an object level. We really don't recommend you use bucket ACLs anymore, and the reason why is because uh, bucket policies are much more granular. Uh, with ACLs, you, can, you only permit uh, access, you cannot explicitly deny access. And, uh, and with ACLs, you can, do, you can enable read or write or full control. So, so where we do see people using ACLs is more at the object level. So for example, if you have somebody across account putting an object into, into your bucket, they can use an ACL to enable full control of that object to the bucket owner. Okay, So that's, that's a common use case for ACLs, but otherwise, IAM policies and bucket policies are really the best way to go. So, uh, so again, an IAM user policy, what can this user do in AWS? And then in the bucket policy, who can access this S3 resource? By default, uh, IAM users have no permissions. Okay? So you enable permissions by creating an IAM policy and then attaching that policy to an IAM user or group or role. Uh, with a bucket policy, uh, buckets are private by default. Once you create a bucket, you can only access it through the bucket owner or the root administrator. You have to explicitly enable 
uh, outside accounts to get access to your bucket through, uh, through a bucket policies. So with cross account, you can use either way. Uh, you can use an IAM role, have people assume an IAM role uh, that have, have privilege permissions to that bucket, or in the bucket policy, you can explicitly say this account has, can have read or write access to that bucket. Thank you. Okay, that's all right, that's fine. Okay, so, so here's what an example IAM user policy looks like. So this is a very simple policy, and essentially it says an effect is allow, you know, you're allowing here in two actions, a put and a get object to a resource. Here we're using a, a, a bucket name, reinvent bucket. So, so that's a pretty basic policy. Uh, and then in the bucket policy, you can see is the same kind of syntax, JSON format. Here, uh, the effect is an allow. Now with a bucket policy, you have another line on the principle. So, so who, so you identify here, I'm identifying an AWS account ID, uh, allowing a get, act, get object to this reinvent bucket. And if you notice in here, in this policy, I put in uh, a condition statement. Uh, this is the, uh, the object tag I was talking about earlier. Existing object tag with a key of project and a value of X. So that's limiting this account ID to, to be able to do a get for objects that are tagged with a project value of X. Okay. So another form of access control is attribute-based access control. And what I mean by attributes are things like uh, your job title, department number, cost center, team name, your manager, uh, things like that. So, so we've had attribute-based access control for a while, but we introduced uh, just, I think it was last week, something called session tags. A session tag, essentially what a session tag allows you to do is use these attributes and pass them through from your identity provider in a session. When, and when you're, somebody's federated into AWS, in that session, you can pass those tags. I think you can pass up to like 50 tags. And these tags are, again, are a key value pair. So you can pass through, say, cost center or department number in that session. And then they can assume an IAM role. And then you can filter, you can restrict access the, from that IAM role using that tag. Now, from a policy perspective, the, the, um, the tag comes through called a principal tag. So here I threw up a little sample policy saying that the principal tag with, say, a, a, a key of team, a name of team, you match that up with an object tag, a resource tag, with the same uh, team name. So that essentially is limit saying that, uh, say, team red can only have access to objects that are tagged with team red. So, so this is a really cool capability. Um, there was a session here at reInvent completely dedicated to attribute-based access control, so I do recommend uh, you, can, you watch that, that video. It's, it's really pretty flexible. So another method for access control is pre-signed URLs. Uh, so essentially what a pre-signed URL is, you have an IAM user or role, uh, they can create a pre-signed URL and their certificate, their security certificate of that IAM role is embedded in the URL. Okay, so when you create this URL, you can be pretty granular. You can specify a specific object key, a specific you know, get or put, and then most importantly, a time duration. You can make this URL specific, only enable it for an hour, a couple hours, a day, and then with, with SIGV4, the maximum is a week. Uh, so it, it's flexible in terms of uh, allowing access to your buckets for people that don't, are not assuming an IAM roles um, or just uh, uh, outside parties access to your buckets. However, you need to be careful because anyone with that URL has the permissions that are embedded in that URL, it has the permissions of that IAM user or role that was, that was used to create the URL. So if anyone sees, if you send out that URL, they can forward it on and on to any other third party, and then they can have that same permission in that URL. So, so as a best practice, what we recommend is create a unique IAM user when you create a uh, pre-signed URL, such that you can then disable, remove those permissions from that IAM user role if you need to disable it before that time duration expires, okay? So, so they can be very, uh, so again, make them very granular, restrict at that time period as much as you can, and, um, and then create a unique role for them. So another set of uh, policy controls is what we consider, call more boundary enforcement, kind of setting guardrails upon which, uh, what people can do in AWS. So there's, there's kind of three things. So AWS organizations, 
uh, VPC virtual private cloud endpoints, and then block public access. So, so organizations is a really cool tool. It's, it's really flexible. It's helpful for you, a way to organize and control your accounts underneath an organization. And within orgs, you have, can have a hierarchy. You can have OUs underneath other organizational units. So you can create them by project team, by line of business, et cetera. And so, so where that's useful from a security perspective is really kind of two things. One, in the, you remember in the bucket policy, I had a specific account ID. So instead of having to update and maintain your bucket policies, adding and removing account IDs as you do ads, moves, and changes, you can use a condition key called principal org ID. So that way you can group your accounts underneath an org and it has an ID associated with it. So you do all your ads, moves, and changes in AWS's org, AWS orgs, and then in the bucket policy, you just set it once and you don't have to modify it. You say, I allow any principal that's underneath this org ID. Okay, so you can use that principal key in, in bucket policies and endpoint policies. The second thing with orgs is service control policies. And so these kind of set like the guardrails, like what are the set of permissions that these users and accounts would have, would be capable of using. Service control policies don't explicitly allow permissions. You still have to use an IAM policy and attach it to that role to actually innate, allow that, that, um, that function, that API call. Um, but they, again, they set the, the, the boundary of what, what somebody can do. Uh, so there, a good example is um, security settings, like changing bucket policies, changing block public access. You set a service control policy to only allow certain key security administrators to change those settings so you don't have security like drift, uh, configuration drift. So, so then uh, VPC endpoints. So from your virtual private cloud, uh, there's like two ways you can access S3. One of them is to put an internet gateway. So you can just have the internet gateway route your traffic to S3 over the internet. And then a number of years ago, we introduced gateway VPC endpoints. So essentially, this, this endpoint, you, what you do is you create, you add it to your routing table in, in your VPC, and then all traffic heading to S3 is routed over that, through that, inter, that endpoint. And so there's, there's really two benefits. One. All the traffic from your VPC to S3 goes over the AWS private backbone and not the internet. And then two, you can put a policy on the VPC endpoint. So it's the same kind of JSON format as the, as the bucket policy. And this is a boundary enforcement policy. So this VPC endpoint policy will tell, will say, state, what can these applications, what can these users in my VPC, what can they access? So the VPC endpoint policy, you list your buckets, the S3 corporate-owned buckets in your VPC, saying you can only access your corporate-owned buckets and not your own personal buckets. And then correspondingly, in the bucket policy, you can say this bucket can only be accessed from this VPC endpoint. So you lock it down from both sides to prevent kind of data exfiltration. So let's, let's go into kind of example of how, how that would work. So, so here we have a VPC, um, and then I created a reInvent bucket, which is a corporate bucket, and then a personal bucket, somebody's, somebody's personal bucket. So, so first, let's look at the uh, VPC endpoint policy. So here I have a, an allow, um, principal star, I put, a put this is a single action put object for the reInvent bucket, and then I put string equals uh, principal org ID. So here I'm using that principal org ID saying, uh, now even though it says principal star, it has to match up where on the principal org ID. Okay, so we, we check that, that validation, make sure this account is underneath that org ID. So, so the effect of that policy is it's allowing access to the reInvent bucket and denying access to the personal bucket. Because this is a boundary enforcement point, uh, you are not able to, you have to explicitly allow access to, to the buckets. So that way, you can whitelist the specific corporate-owned buckets in your VPC endpoint policy. And then, on your bucket policy, this is the policy on the reInvent bucket. So here, I'm put, I put a deny statement in. So essentially, I put deny, principal star, any S3 action, S3 asterisk wildcard, for the reInvent bucket, where under the condition that string not equals source VPC E, VPC endpoint, equals this certain value. So essentially what that is saying is that this bucket can only be accessed 
through requests that are coming from this specific VPC endpoint. So the effect of that is that nobody can access that bucket uh, from the internet. It has to come from the VPC endpoint. This is the recommendation for, for data exfiltration. I, I also could have uh, put the principal org ID also in the in a bucket policy. And instead of principal star, just put the principal org ID as a, another condition statement in the, in the bucket policy. Okay. So uh, let's talk about public access. Uh, so public access, what we mean by public access is any anonymous or overly permissive uh, policy is considered public access. Uh, so remember, buckets are private by default. Uh, so you have to enable public access. And there are two ways to do that. One is through an access control list. So with an ACL, you could put, say, this bucket can be accessed by this specific account. That is not considered public access. If you are specific about an account ID, that's not uh, public access. What we consider public is when you have, there are some predefined user groups. All users, which is anyone on the internet, or any authenticated user, which is pretty much any AWS account, then that's considered public. Then you can also do it through bucket policies. So if you have an overly permissive policy, things like principal star, resource star, can do any action, that's a public policy. Uh, another one is if you, even if you do put a condition key here, for example, I put a condition key source VPC, it has to come from VPC, but then look, I put a VPC wildcard. So essentially you're saying any VPC from anyone can access this bucket. That's overly permissive and that's considered public. So we use an automated reasoning logic to scan your bucket policies to identify whether it's public or not. And also you can see in our documentation, what are the condition keys when, when a buc bucket's public. Um, so we use, um, if you look in the S3 console, you'll see we flag which buckets are public and which ones are not. You can look, also look at Trust Advisor that has a, a free bucket check, and then uh, AWS Config can, uh, can flag which buckets are, are public. And then just to reinforce, again, explicit cross-account access is not public, is not considered public. So turning on block public access will not block uh, cross-account access unless you're using an overly permissive policy to enable cross-account. Sometimes people just put that first policy, resource star, principal star, to enable cross-account, but that's an overly permissive policy. So, so with block public access, we introduced it last year at reInvent. We've seen a great take up over last year. We've been very active in terms of marketing and promoting block public access. Uh, so there are four security settings. I'll talk about them next. You can set them at the account level or at the bucket level. And our best practice is set it at the account level such that any future buckets underneath that account automatically inherit those uh, BPA settings. And also another best practice, if you have both public uh, content and private content, keep it not just in separate buckets, but even under separate accounts. So that way you can kind of firewall the two uh, separately, so the, you know, less opportunity for making mistakes. And you're going to have different set of permissions and different controls and uh, configurations across those different accounts. And then um, you can use AWS organizations, the service control policies, to limit who can actually change those settings for block, block public access. So the four settings are essentially the first two block public ACLs, and the third and the fourth block public policies. So, so the first one says uh, and you block any new public ACLs from being applied to your buckets or the uploading of, of objects with public ACLs. And the second one blocks uh, existing uh, public ACLs uh, from, uh, ex uh, prevents them from being granted public access. And the third blocks any new public policies, and number four block, uh, prevents any existing bucket policies from, from naming public access. So, so when you turn on block public access, it doesn't remove the ACL, it doesn't remove the, the policy, it puts a deny statement. When we do the authorization logic, it puts a deny statement for any anonymous user. Okay. So that means if you turn off block public access, uh, it will then, the ACL and the policy are still there. So this is a view in the console. So you can just check block all public access. Really the recommendation, check all four. If it's a private bucket, just automatically, just go ahead and check all four settings. And you can do that. This is the, the view at the account level in, in the console. All right. 
So let's get into access points. So we're re really excited about access points and what you can do with them. So, so like I mentioned before, it's kind of like what access points is, is targeting is going after uh, multi-tenant buckets where you have a lot of different uh, folks or entities, IAM roles, applications accessing a, a single bucket. And, and the bucket policies are becoming more and more complicated because you're granting individual access to different roles uh, for different conditions, et cetera. So some people are running into bucket policy size limitations, and also it's harder and harder to interpret these large bucket policies. So, so here, uh, I'm showing just a, a very basic example. You have, say, a finance group, a sales group, and a developer group. Each of them are accessing a bucket. You still have the same the bucket and the bucket policy, but now you can create access points per user, per application, per microservice. Um, so you have here a finance access point, a sales access point, and a developer access point. Uh, each access point uh, has its own policy. So essentially what you can do, the bucket policies, you can simplify them by moving the sp specific policy language for different roles or user groups to each access point. So each policy becomes much smaller and much easier to manage and you can create and delete access points over time. So, so it makes it more flexible. So, so before access points, how does it work? So say, for example, I have an example here with reInvent Bucket. It has a policy on it. And then you have a default host name. So the, the bucket name, reInvent Bucket, .s3, .region, .amazon, AWS com, And all the different user groups use the same host name. And then you use the bucket policy to filter who can access what in that bucket as well as the IAM roles. Now, with an access point, an access point itself is a S3 resource, meaning it has its own host name, it has its own Amazon resource name, or ARN, and it has its own uh, resource policy associated with it. So in this access point, uh, the, I have an example here, the access point name is my AP, and then when you create an access point name, we append the account ID of the bucket owner to the access point name. So, uh, and then there's S3 access point, which is a new subdomain, uh, region.amazonaws.com. So the, the naming of the access points is much more flexible than, say, bucket names. You, have, you can uniquely create access point names per account ID per region. So now, instead of like, you know how what bucket names are globally, need to be globally unique, and so sometimes it can be very challenging creating new buckets because you have to come up with really weird kind of combinations of letters and, and symbols to come up with like a new bucket name. And so it's not really descriptive of how, you, how you're using the bucket. Now with an access point, it's account, region, local, so you can, your total flexibility in terms of how you use the, the account access point names. You can create a sales access point name or a dev access point name. And you can reuse the same access point name across regions uh, because it's uh, account and region specific. Then with the ARN, here's the new ARN. And if you notice, we have the account ID now, account ID access point uh, my AP. The account ID is in the ARN, uh, which is common with most other AWS services. But this is the first time now with S3 that the account ID is in the ARN. And I'll show you how that helps in terms of things like uh, data exfiltration. Uh, because when you see a, a bucket name, you're not exactly sure, well, what is the account owner of that bucket, right? Sometimes you maybe miss a dash or a number or something like that, and you may be ac trying to access a, a, the wrong bucket name on a wrong account. Now the account ID uh, is there so you, in the host name and the ARN. So now you know exactly this bucket is owned by this, uh, this account. So, so let's go back to that example. You have three kind of uh, groups, an, an admin group, a sales group, a dev group. The, here's the reInvent bucket. It has its bucket policy. You still have the default host name, the reInvent bucket .s3 .region .amazon AWS .com. And now I created two access points. I created a sales access point for the sales group and then a dev access point for the dev group. And then you can see each has their own individual host name. Each has its own ARN and each has its own policy, okay? So now you can create up to, each account can create up to 1,000 access points per region. So really, it's very flexible. You can create a lot of access points for, for each bucket. So you can be very granular, again, per microservice. Um, we have some customers that are saying, 
All right, for each access point, I'm gonna restrict that to a specific prefix in your bucket. So each access point only has access to a certain prefix in your bucket, and you can do that through the access point policy. And then the bucket policy, you leave that to kind of more generic statements that apply across everything, uh, across all access points. So the bucket policy becomes smaller, and you don't have to modify it as, as often. So, so just to go kind of do a, a, a recap on the, our, our overview on the features, again, each account can create up to 1,000 access points per region. Another great benefit is that the access point can be locked down to a VPC. Now, of course, you can do that in the access point policy. That's fine. But also, in addition to that, when you configure an access point, you can say this access point is set to only accept uh, uh, request from a, vi a specific VPC ID. And that's part of the configuration settings of, of the access point. So then you can start applying service control policies to say, I only want to allow customers to create access points that are locked down to VPCs. The other, uh, the other option is an internet. You can create an internet-facing access point, but like I said, with service control policies, you can restrict them uh, to VPC only. Uh, the policy support in access point is the same uh, as full policy support as in the bucket policy. Same resource, conditional statements. It's the same authorization logic that, author that goes through your access point policies and your, and your bucket policies. So you have the same capabilities on both, and both of them are, are the same size, the 20 KB size limitation. Um, as I mentioned, the service control policies can be limited through uh, access point permissions can be limited to service control policies. Uh, the access point names live in your private namespace, so you have, like I said, very, a lot of flexibility in, in naming them. And then the access points have the uh, account ID in the ARN. So, so this is a view uh, of the S3 console. We created a new tab. So this here, I've collect, uh, clicked on a specific bucket, and now there's a tab called access points. So this will show you all of the access points that are tied to that bucket, and you can only tie uh, an access point to one bucket at this point. So, uh, so this will show you, all right, for this bucket, here are all the access points that, are, that have been uh, created for this, for this bucket. And then once you uh, create an access point, Here's kind of some of the um, variables. So you can see in the top, it's, it's underneath a specific bucket. Uh, you set an access point name. Then here's where you set, uh, lock it down to a VPC. And then down below, uh, you, you enter the VPC ID. Okay. So, um, so let's look at the policies some more. Um, so with the, this is before access points, here's kind of an example where in the bucket policy, uh, you're allowing these different IAM roles uh, permissions. So here in the bucket policy, I have the sales role has access, can do a get and a put through um, the prefix, uh, project one prefix, and then uh, a sales role has as uh, get object permissions, uh, or sorry, uh, dev role. The, uh, the dev role has access to a get object for project two. So these bucket policies, again, you have to keep adding and adding more and more lines and conditional statements in your bucket policies that allow permissions to different, uh, different roles. Now, with access points, you can move that logic to each access point. So the sales access point ha allows access, that's policy snippet, uh, allowing access to the project one prefix is in the access point, uh, sales access point. And then the dev access point allows permissions, the get object to the project two uh, prefix in that bucket. And then in the bucket policy, you do need to put a, a simple policy statement in your bucket saying granting uh, object access to your access points. So this is kind of a, a policy you set it once and then you don't need to modify it or change it. So this is a, a little snippet you need to allow in your, put in your bucket policy to allow permissions to the access point. Okay. Now, let's talk further around uh, locking these down to VPCs. So another thing we, uh, that customers have asked about is, I want to disable that default host name. I only want to allow access through access points. Uh, so, so now you can do that in the bucket policy. In the policy itself, you can say, only allow access through access points. And not only that, you can say, only allow access through access points that are VPC configured, 
and network origin of VPC only. So here I've locked down these different access points to a different VPC as part of the configuration setting. Now I, I've had, uh, this week we've had different questions. I have had questions on, on an access point could I have put, lock it down to multiple VPCs? In a configuration setting today, it's only one VPC. However, if you want to enable an access point to be accessed from multiple VPCs, use that in the access point policy. In the policy, you can just list it, you know, source, put a condition statement of source VPC. If you want to put multiple, put that in the access point policy. Now, another thing to be aware of, access points is new. We just introduced it this week. It's, it is GA across all commercial and gov cloud regions. The default host name is still being used by a number of AWS services. So for example, like CloudTrail is using the default host name. So you'll see over time, uh, more and more AWS services supporting access points. In our documentation, we do list the, the current list of AWS services that support access points. So uh, beware, if, by blocking the default host name, it may be uh, blocking some AWS services initially. So just, just be aware of that um, when you set your, your bucket policies. So, so, here's, so again, on that VPC uh, locking it down, here's a service control policy that's uh, only allowing access to with an access point network origin of VPC. That's essentially saying that you're only allowing people to create access points uh, that are, have a VPC, locked down to a VPC. And then on the, on the right is the bucket policy that's saying um, deny access unless a string not equals the access point origin of VPC. So essentially that's saying I only want to allow access through access points that have VPC configured. And then it's important to note, you do need to put an allow statement for access points in your bucket policy. So this, you do need the allow underneath this as well. So you, the policy needs to put an allow statement for the access points to, to access the objects underneath that bucket. Okay. So some other things you can do with access points, because the, the naming of access points is a specific per account per region, you can use the same access point name across regions. So for example, here, you have a prod bucket in one region, a backup bucket in a different region. The bucket names have to be unique. Um, so you do have to, sometimes you have to put application logic to know which bucket is in which region. Now um, you can have the same access point name. I put like bi dash the account ID. Um, so you, use, you can re-leverage the same access point name across regions. So, so that can help with some, uh, some application logic. And then, and then for the VPC endpoint policy, if you remember before I said, all right, in your VPC endpoint policy, you whitelist specific corporate-owned bucket names in there to say I can, you can only access my corporate-owned buckets. Now, instead of having to list all your bucket names and, for example, making a mistake on a bucket name, now you can say um, allow access to uh, S3 data access point accounts and then put the account ID. So that essentially this is saying from my VPC, only allow access to access points owned by this account. Okay, so now you no longer need to whitelist specific bucket names because that maybe can grow a long list and then you, some customers are running into VPC endpoint policy size limitations. Now this dramatically simplifies VPC endpoint policies and again, you, set, you can set it once and then, uh, and then not have to modify as you create or remove uh, uh, buckets or access points. And again, access points, you can uh, create them, uh, delete them afterwards, they're very flexible, so you can create an access point for, say, a temporary time period if you need to, okay? So it's pretty powerful. So a, a question I get then is, all right, so, so we have IAM policies, we have access point policies now, we have bucket policies, uh, VPC endpoint policies, which ones take hierarchy? Which one uh, is, is above another one in terms of your authorization logic? And, and the answer is uh, we evaluate them all. We look at them all together when we do, we see a request coming to S3. We look at all of them together. And when we start with a, a deny, a default of deny for that request, we scan all of the policies across these. And if we see an explicit deny, then we deny the request. If there is no deny in any of those policies, then we look to see an allow. There has to be an allow somewhere in those policies. If we see an allow, then we will allow the, the request. Otherwise, if there's no allow, we will deny the request by default, okay? 
So, so we, again, we look at all of the policies together when we see a request. All right, so let's talk about uh, data protection. So, so data protection, I'm um, talking about inadvertent um, data deletion or malicious data deletion because sometimes we have customers coming to us saying, hey, I, I deleted this mission critical data. It's really important. Can you help me recover it? Once you do a delete, uh, we immediately delete it out of our index and even we can't recover that data. So, so this, is, this is really important for your mission critical data. Uh, so we have four um, tools available for you. There's versioning, object lock, multi-factor authentication, and then replication. So, so first is versioning. So this essentially adds some friction to doing a delete. So essentially, if you do a delete uh, with versioning, we will put a delete marker on there so you could no longer see it, say, if you do a list command. Um, but uh, in order to actually delete the object, you have to do a delete of the object with the specific version ID on it. Um, so that way you can kind of, if you do a delete, you can then go back and, and uh, recover that, that object. We create, you know, keep versions of, the, of, of that object. And then versioning is required for object lock and replication. So object lock, we introduced that last year at Minvian, where you make your objects immutable. Essentially, you can write once but read many times. So, so we prevent anyone from making modifications to those objects. Object lock is at the object version level. And so there are a lot of interesting use cases for object lock. Some of them are for compliance reasons, like financial SEC compliance. Uh, some of it is for like court legal holds uh, or court orders where you need to make sure that these, these objects are not deleted. And with object lock, you can set a time duration. You can say, I want to make sure these objects are not uh, modifiable for five years or three years or one year or whatever. And then with legal hold, that could be an indefinite time period. And then there's, there's kind of two modes. There's a governance mode and then a compliance mode. With governance mode, you still have a security administrator who can change the settings of object lock. Um, so that's good for just general data protection. But then, for then there's a compliance mode where not even a security administrator can change it. Once it's in compliance mode, it is set. It's locked down for that time period that you set. So that's really good. I mean, the log data and other things for auditing, it's really good to use object lock for. Then um, you can do multi-factor authentication. Again, yet another step to confirm that this delete call was, is appropriate by adding in another, another key, external device, to authenticate, to authorize that request. And then replication. So replication is a little bit more for rogue actor data protection, whereby you have a source bucket and a destination bucket, and then there's something called ownership override where the owners are different on the different source and destination buckets, and you have different policies on them, such that if somebody, as a valid user, deletes the data in the source bucket, that uh, role does not have access to do the same deletion in the destination bucket. They have different ownership, account ownership, different policies with different permissions. Uh, so, so we've had cross-region replication for many years. You replicate them across two different regions. And then just a few months ago, we introduced same region replication. So even in the same region, you can have, you can automatically uh, replicate objects from a source bucket to a destination bucket. So that's really helpful, again, for mission critical data to prevent rogue actor uh, deletion. Okay, so let's, let's talk about encryption. So with encryption, there's, there's two methods of encryption. There's encryption for data in transit and then encryption for data at rest. Uh, if you use the uh, SDK, uh, we will use uh, HTTPS TLS to encrypt all your data in transit. Um, and then you can, or you can do that in your own application logic. Now, there is a best practice where in the bucket policies, put in, there's a condition key called secure transport. And what that does is it enforces that any request comes over TLS authenticated session. And it will block and deny any requests coming over a session that's not TNS, TLS enabled. That condition key is secure transport. So, and then for encryption and data at rest, uh, there are multiple options. Um, one is uh, server-side encryption, where we encrypt it in S3. And then the other is uh, client-side, so it's encrypted before it gets to S3. So, so the most commonly used are SSE server-side encryption S3 and then SSE KMS. Those are by far the most common that we see. And, and when we do encryption, there's, there's two keys. There's a data key that encrypts each object, and there's a unique data key per object. 
And then there's an envelope master key that encrypts the data key. So, so really, the, the difference between these options is at how the master key is managed. With SSE S3, S3 manages the master keys. We handle it ourselves. We do the key rotations. You don't need to worry about it. So that's a very common uh, tool. It's, it's free. There's no charge. You don't need to worry about the encryption. Very simple to use, so very widely, very popular. Now, if you have your own corporate standards around how you do key rotation, you want to control which keys are used for which objects, for which buckets, for which uh, prefixes, et cetera, um, you can use KMS key, uh, uh, key management service. And there, so you define how often you want to rotate the keys. Uh, and then you can also put policies. You can put a policy restricting who can access that master key. So it's just another kind of IAM resource policy. It's the same thing. You can now apply that as yet another layer of authentication logic that's uh, used for accessing the KMS key. So that gives you even more security. Then, but if you want to ma manage your master keys yourselves, that's, that's fine. You can do that through customer-provided keys. How that works is you provide the master key in the put header uh, when you're doing a put into, uh, of an object into S3 bucket. We will use that master key to do the encryption. We don't store the master key. Uh, and so therefore, you have to put the same master key when you do the get. And then we'll use that master key to decrypt it and send it back to you. And then lastly, on the client side, you can use the Amazon SDKs to encrypt it before it even gets to AWS. You can do it yourself with your own application. We just store the encrypted bits in, in S3. Now, now, a best practice is to turn on default encryption in your buckets, really encrypt everything. Uh, so it's a one-time bucket setup. Uh, you have different options. We allow you can, to use either SSC S3 or SSC KMS as the default. Um, so this will automatically encrypt all new objects coming into that bucket. Uh, now, we do get a, a, a common question is, how do I encrypt existing objects in my bucket? And so, uh, so we've added encryption status in the S3 inventory report. The inventory report is a, is a full uh, report listing all the objects in your bucket. And we state which, which ones are unencrypted, which ones have SSC S3, SSC KMS. So you can use the inventory report along with a new feature we introduced earlier this year called batch operations. Batch operations is a really cool tool that allows you to manage like billions of operations in a clean way. We, we manage it, you execute a job with a manifest file coming from the inventory report, and then we manage all those jobs on the server side and we give you a completion report. We tell you which jobs succeeded and which ones failed. So it's a very easy way to do very large scale operations in S3. And, and the thing is, a few months ago, we introduced, a, we wrote a blog post stating how you can use batch operations for exi encrypting existing objects. Essentially, you do like a copy command. You, you execute a copy command using uh, encryption on, on the copy. So, so yeah, check out that, uh, that blog post. And, and this is encryption at the default at the bucket level. If you can, on the put of an object, uh, you can uh, request different encryption. So for example, if you use uh, your own customer uh, managed, provided man uh, master key, you can still do that on the put, and we will do what that uh, object put uses. And then we, we use the default encryption if there is no uh, encryption uh, in, the, in the header of the put. Okay, then we use the default encryption. Okay, so now monitoring. So, so there are a lot of tools we have for uh, managing your, your permissions. How do you kind of uh, evaluate, understand what are the settings, configuration settings of your buckets and your policies? So, so as I mentioned, the uh, inventory report has now the encryption status in it, so it's a very, really nice tool to use. Um, AWS config, that's another really nice tool. So, so this, you can create uh, config rules uh, they're like checking your buckets if they don't have encryption, default encryption turned on. Uh, scanning your buckets to see if they have public read or public write permissions. And this will flag any misconfigured buckets. And then, so it'll identify any misconfigured buckets, and then you could, say, trigger some actions based on that. So this is a really nice tool to make sure that your, your buckets are, are adhering to your corporate standards. Trusted Advisor is a nice tool for scan. It, we have an automatic scan in there for your public buckets. The same automated reasoning logic, we determine whether a, a pub, bucket's public or not. That the results of that are put into Trusted Advisor, and this is a, a free check, bucket check. 
Um, and then we have Amazon Macy for scanning PII, our personally identifiable information. So things like um, uh, social security numbers, credit cards, uh, or whatever format you, you kind of specify. So it'll scan and identify where that information is in your S3 buckets. And so then for, you can make sure that those buckets have the strict permissions set around those. And then, and then on Monday, uh, IAM team introduced uh, this access analyzer. And so this is continuing on in developing our automated reasoning logic to look at not just public buckets, public versus not public, but identifying your cross-account access. This is really solving the problem of, did you write your, your resource policy to match your intent? Did you write it correctly? Did you, maybe you wrote the, the policy incorrectly? And you wanna see what are the permissions that are resulting from those resource policies. Um, so again, for S3, you can identify what is the cross account and under which conditions do those outside accounts have access to your buckets. Now, so you create an analyzer and this analyzer is constantly running and evaluating your policies. Uh, so it, it sees that if you um, change a policy, it will trigger a rerun of the access analyzer. So it's constantly monitoring and, and any uh, generating new findings as you make changes to, to your policies. Um, so, and again, it's using a very advanced kind of automated reasoning logic. So, so how does this work? Uh, so you start with a, like what we call a root of trust. So that root of trust could be your accounts, uh, and in the future, looking at things like organizational IDs or organizational units, saying, all right, that's my zone of trust. Who outside my account or org has, has uh, permissions? So, so for today, we support um, five uh, different resources. Uh, IAM roles, S3 buckets, Lambda functions, uh, KMS keys, and SQS queues. So it scans all these resource policies. You create an analyzer that, that scans those policies, and then it generates findings. And then you can take actions on those, on those findings. So, so I have a few screenshots I'll, I'll take you through. So this is a screenshot, this is the IAM console. There is now a, uh, a line item I highlighted here in, in yellow, it's kind of this access analyzer. That's a new menu item on the access analyzer. And there's really three steps. You create an analyzer, it generates findings, and then you take action on those findings. Was that finding good or was that not intended? So, so when you create an analyzer, these are region specific. Uh, you create a name, select a name, uh, you select a zone of trust, so today it's an account ID, you know, in the future it would be, say, an org ID, or a U ID, and you can create some tags. So uh, once you create an analyzer, then it generates findings. So, so in the findings, uh, there's kind of three categories. There's an active category, uh, there's a, uh, an archived category, and then a resolved category. So active means that it just it generated the finding and it's waiting for you to kind of take action on, on that finding. Um, uh, archived means yes, that finding was good, that's what I wanted, I'm gonna go ahead and archive that. Resolved means that you, you found the finding, you changed the policy, after that change in policy, that original finding is no longer valid, it then gets moved into the resolve state. So you can see what prior um, uh, privileges you had, you had uh, allowed. So on this, on this, it's a single pane of glass view where you can see all of your uh, access privileges, uh, permissions. So it creates a finding ID, um, it generates a, uh, here's a list of the resources. Is this an S3 bucket? Is this a, a Lambda function? Uh, it has, lists the account. What is the external account that, have, that has access to that resource? Under which conditions does it have access to the resource? Is it has to come from like a source VPC? What is the permission? Is it read? Is it write? Is it list? We'll list what are the permissions that are granted. And then lastly, when was it last updated? When was the last time we scanned the policy uh, to generate the finding? Uh, you can do manual scans, uh, rescans uh, as well. Then you can, you can also filter your findings. Say you only want to look at the findings, the resources for, say, a specific S3 bucket. So you can filter the results on that, on that console. And then if you click on a finding, uh, this, is, uh, this is the finding details page. So in the finding details page, uh, it lists uh, the same information that was on the other screen. So uh, what is the resource? Uh, who is the external account? 
uh, what, is the, what are the conditions that they're allowed, uh, and what are the specific uh, permission API calls, get or put object, et cetera. So there are two uh, actions then on this details page. You can either uh, click archive, meaning yes, that's good, that's exactly what I wanted, or it can there's a, a link that'll take you to the S3 console to say, hey, I wanna make a change to that bucket policy, um, uh, take me to the, to the S3 console. So if you hit click archive, then the status changes from active to archived, and then again, puts in the archived section. And then uh, with the findings uh, are resolved are when you went and changed the bucket policy, then it does a rescan and then sees that this finding is no longer valid, um, and then it sets it to the resolved state. So we've also integrated Access Analyzer into the S3 console. So this is a view of the S3 console with the Access Analyzer information in it. So with the S3 console, we explicitly did uh, two breakouts. We did a breakout of uh, what buckets are public and then which buckets have cross-account access in that second section. So, so here, um, you can, for the buckets that are public, we allow you to take an action to turn on block public access if that was, uh, these are not intended to be buck public buckets. Um, and then in the, uh, uh, in the cross account, you can see, was this through an ACL or was this through uh, a policy? And then you can download a report. You can, uh, in your findings, you can download the report for, for S3. Uh, so it's, again, a really nice tool. Did your bucket policies actually implement the right permissions that you intended to? So it's, it's a really nice tool to check and to validate that your, these policies are correct. Now, in addition to Access Analyzer, you also want to audit the access through to S3. And that's where CloudTrail comes in and server access logs. So CloudTrail is really the, the preferred best method. It has the most functionality. Um, server access logs is a nice tool as well. It is a free tool, server, server access logs. And now with access points, it will tell you what um, host name the request came in on for S3. Did this request come on the default host name, or did it come on an access point? Which access point did it use this, this request? So now this is a really great way to determine who's still using your default host name, who's now access, using access points for making these requests. You can track that both in CloudTrail and in server access logs. Okay. All right. So to summarize, uh, here's a list of the best practices that we recommend for S3 that we talked about. First, um, enable block public access at the account level. This is really important. So after this session, go back and log into your S3 console and turn on block public access. Um, so, so how many people have actually turned on BPA? Raise your hands. Okay, it's about a third to a half. Okay, that's pretty, that's pretty good adoption. For everyone else, the first thing you do, you can stay here in the room. This is the last session. You can turn on block public access in your, in your uh, uh, accounts. Uh, another thing with block public, we do get feedback from customers who are saying, well, I'm afraid. I don't want to turn on block public access because it, it may break some applications. Maybe they are using public policies to access my bucket. Another thing, on uh, access point, you can configure BPA at the access point level. So you can configure it at the bucket level and at the access point level. The recommendation is still, if a private bucket, turn it on at the account, uh, at the account level. Um, but if you want to test it, this is kind of A-B testing. If you want to test what happens if I do turn on block public access, set it at the access point, and so it, there's not set at the bucket level, but set it at the access point level, and use, all, use the access point for all your requests, for all your applications, et cetera, to validate that that access point policy is correct and everything works, and then you can turn it on at the, at the bucket level. Um, the other thing with access points, that it's the same thing for policies. If you want to make a change to a bucket policy, you could, say, put it in an access point, first, and then test it, validate it, test it, make sure applications are working right, and then you can make that, then carry that change over to the bucket to, after you've already validated that everything is working properly. So access points are a nice, good kind of A-B testing. So uh, encrypt everything, so SSE S3, SSE KMS, encrypt everything in your, in your buckets. Leverage access points now to scope and fine-grain access per user, per application, per microservice. 
Um, again, and be very granular in the access point policies. Restrict them to specific prefixes or use object tags to filter what they can access. Use uh, bucket policies to enforce TLS. Use that secure transport condition key to enforce TLS on all requests. Send traffic via VPC endpoints and access points. Data exfiltration is extremely important. Now we've got some great combination of VPC endpoints with access points to really lock down those, those buckets, making the policies much easier to say, I only want access to my corporate-owned buckets through uh, the uh, access points and on the VPC endpoint policies. Enable object lock versioning and MFA delete for inadvertent data deletion, and then replication for uh, rogue actor protection. And then lastly, um, use CloudTrail for your monitoring. You know, all your buckets so that you see that audit trail. Um, and then you can now use Access Analyzer to interpret the policies, make sure your policy, resource policies are uh, what they're doing, what they should be doing. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this session. <laughs>